Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the third and final IPS Northern Lectures by Mr. Patrick Daniel, our 11th SR Northern Fellow for the Study of Singapore. Today, Mr. Daniel will be delivering his lecture titled Envisioning Desired Futures for Singapore and for the Local Media. Following his lecture, Mr. Daniel will take questions from the audience in a Q&A session. The Q&A session will be chaired by Dr. Shashi Jayakumar, Senior Fellow and Head of the Center of Excellence for National Security at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies. Before we begin, please allow me to go over some housekeeping rules for the event. The lecture is being streamed live on Facebook. It will also be recorded and uploaded onto our IPS website and our social media platforms later. For our audience members here today, please be reminded to put your phones to silent mode. During the Q&A session, you may step up to the mic to ask your questions. For our online audience, please submit your comments and questions at any time during the lecture through the Facebook comments box. We will try our best to answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A. We would also like to hear your views on the event. There will be a link in the feed at the end of the lecture, which you can click on to submit your feedback. Without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Patrick Daniel to begin his final lecture titled Envisioning Desired Futures for Singapore and for the Local Media. Mr. Daniel, please. Good afternoon, friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, for those of you who've, uh, this is going to be my concluding uh, lecture. For those of you who've joined all three, uh, a special heartfelt thanks. Uh, in my first two lectures, I spoke on the Singapore media's long and winding road from 1924 to 19, oh, sorry, to 2022. And in my second lecture, I spoke on the global challenge of grappling with the darker side of the internet. In today's talk, I want to look forward into the future. Let me give you an outline of what I'll cover. I started preparing this third lecture by wanting to look ahead to 2045 when Singapore celebrates its 80th anniversary of independence. It so happens that the Straits Times will celebrate its 200th anniversary that year. So 2045 is a good date on my horizon of about 20 plus years. I wanted to ask which trends will profoundly affect Singapore's future as a society? And also, what would it take for the Straits Times and our legacy media to thrive past 2045? I found out quite quickly that it's not easy to be a futurist. Actually, I should rephrase that. It's not easy to take the guesswork out of being an amateur futurist. After speaking to some people with experience in scenario planning and strategic futures, I learned about an alternative approach, which I want to use today. It's called backcasting. Let me explain what backcasting is. Simply put, it's the opposite of forecasting. In forecasting, you start from the present you study today's trends, you take in a few foreseeable trends, and then you project into the future. In backcasting, you start by asking, what is your desired feasible future? You put yourself in that desired future, and from there, you look backward or backcast to the present. And then you plot discrete steps you need to take to get to your desired future. Now, truth be told, if this sounds a little bit like pop psychology, you won't be wrong. Because it does sound like the old saying, begin with the end in mind. 
Some of us might remember Stephen Covey's book 30 years ago, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It was Covey's habit number two, begin, begin with the end in mind. Now that advice has a much longer history, going back to the Roman Stoic philosopher Seneca, who in the first century AD wrote a work called On the Tranquility of the Mind. And his words in Latin translate to, let all your efforts be directed to something and keep that end in view. Let me get back to the modern iteration. The primary elements of the backcasting method were outlined in the 1980s by a Canadian professor, John B. Robinson. He published a paper in 1988 which he titled, Unlearning and Backcasting, Rethinking Some of the Questions We Ask About the Future. In his abstract, Robinson says, in most cases, we ask the wrong questions when we forecast. What are needed are backcasting techniques that reveal the possibility of alternative futures. The focus then shifts from prediction and likelihood to feasibility and choice. So the key words in backcasting are, number one, alternative futures, number two, feasibility, and number three, choice. To better grasp this method, let me suggest a brief thought exercise by applying backcasting to something current, the situation in Ukraine, which NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, finds itself in. Indulge me for a moment. Imagine if NATO had done a backcasting exercise immediately after the, Berlin, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 89 and the subsequent fall of the whole Iron Curtain. What desired futures would NATO have envisioned for itself back then? Now, as a side note, what I'm doing here is actually backcasting the backcasting method. I guess I'm taking a leaf from Francis Fukuyama, who has himself noted that the current events have been dubbed the end of the end of history. Amen to that. Back to NATO's choices. Now, one choice in 1990 for NATO was to expand and admit whichever of the former Soviet republics that wanted to join the community of liberal democratic nations in Europe. Another choice was to heed those who belong to the realist school of international relations, who counseled greater care in dealing with the weakened superpower in the neighborhood. Both are valid desired futures. And you could do the same backcasting exercise for Ukraine and also for Russia. I'll leave you to complete those exercises, but I'll highlight one obvious lesson. You have to be careful what you wish for as your desired future especially when you are experiencing the flush of victory or equally the shame of defeat. Let me leave it there and move to the question of Singapore's desired futures. Now, there are many dimensions to a country's desired future, geopolitics, domestic politics, the climate crisis, the economy, and just about every sector of society. I was happy to see this headline in the BT last week, on Singapore's net zero carbon ambition. Got it. The goal of net zero was moved from the second half of the century to by or around mid-century. Now, together with the very bold carbon tax increases announced in the budget, this is actually in an excellent example of backcasting because the planners put themselves in the mid-century, chose their desired future, net zero carbon emissions, then worked out the carbon taxes that were in needed now 
to get to that future. And that's why the, uh, the hikes were so steep. Now, the budget debate also saw several other transformative moves. Uh, another example was the SAF's Digital and Intelligence Service alongside Army, Navy, and Air Force. But the question is, how will it add up to a desired future as a country? What would be the composite picture? Now, as I thought about this question, I came to the view that Singapore's founding fathers envisioned in 1966 a remarkably clear desired future when they crafted the pledge that all Singaporean students still recite daily. Now, the Singapore Pledge contains three main elements. First, one united people, regardless of race, language, or religion. Second, a democratic society based on justice and equality. And third, happiness, prosperity, and progress for the nation. Now, this too was an exceptional exercise in envisioning the future. Now, I should tell you a bit of the background to this. The Singapore Pledge, or at least its draft, is attributed to S. Uh, Rajaratnam, the foreign minister at the time. But interestingly, it was the education ministry that proposed the idea in October 1965. The education minister then, Ong Pang Bun, sent two different drafts to Rajaratnam, who applied his considerable skills and sent back a stronger third draft. The final version was finalized in August of 1966 after substantive changes uh, and, and approved by the, by the cabinet. No time frame was set for this pledge. It was an open-ended effort to promote national loyalty and consciousness. And a pressing worry at the time was to overcome divisions of race, language, and religion. One thing we can quickly agree on is this. The Singapore Pledge has remarkably stood the test of time. So if we are going to do a backcasting now, a backcasting exercise now, over a 20-year horizon, the pledge would actually be an excellent place to start. The task of updating our desired future for 2045 would be to see where and how the pledge should be modified or added to to take in new priorities and challenges. And that's what I'd like to do. First, the goal of being a united people and not one riven by race, language, or religion. Now, in Rajaratnam's draft, the words he used were for Singaporeans to, quote, forget differences of race, language, and religion and become one united people. Forget differences. Now, looking at how policies in this area have since developed, it's not surprising to me that Rajaratnam's suggested wording was changed. The emphasis in the past decades has been not to create a Singaporean race, but a Singaporean identity where all groups can rightfully retain their culture, language, and religion. In my view, it was an inspired choice to be a multicultural society. But there are already calls to drop the categorization of CIMO, Chinese, Malay, Indian, and others. Now, this needs further debate on whether forgetting differences should or should not be part of a new desired future. Now, on this, of course, a further observation I have is that there are also intra-ethnic differences, as well as differing perspectives between new citizens and uh, let's call them citizens born here. Now this brings me to an important issue. There are now far many more differences in our society than just race, language, and religion. 
One key dimension, I would argue, is domestic political differences. Singapore is increasingly becoming a politically diverse society with quote unquote men and women in white and those in blue and other colors. How to remain united in the face of this political diversity will require some deep thinking. The seriousness of this challenge is evident in the political polarization we see in so many democracies, the prime example being the United States. Now, yet another dimension is sexual orientation and gender identity. The last few decades have seen dramatic changes in global attitudes and acceptance of the LGBTQ community. A Pew study found, interestingly, that greater social acceptance has been the result of more people knowing someone who is LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. Now, in Singapore, while social acceptance has grown, divisions remain between liberals and conservatives, mainly on religious grounds. So changes in official positions over Section 377A of the Penal Code, for example, have therefore been deliberate to manage these divisions. In fact, the divide in values between liberals and conservatives in Singapore is a much broader one that cuts across many issues. So these and other differences will need to be part of any new formulation of one united people. I will come back to this. I want to move on to a second area, equality in our society. There are many aspects to this, equal rights, equal treatment, equality before the law, gender equality, etc. But the two key ones are equality of opportunities and equality of outcomes. Now, equality of opportunities has all along been integral to Singapore's ideology. Upward social mobility has been high as a result. As Deputy Prime Minister Taman Shanmugaratnam put it, social mobility must be, quote, at the heart and soul of our ambition for the future, unquote. But inequality of outcomes remains an issue with growing societal pressures for things like wealth taxes and minimum wages to close the gap and be a more equal society. The ninth Northern Fellow, Ravi Menon, covered this in his lecture last July on being an inclusive society. Let me quote him. Inequality of outcomes reflects inequality of ability and effort and also luck. So an equal society will not be seen as just or fair by most people, he said. Then he continued. I believe what most of us want instinctively is an inclusive society, one that provides broadly equal opportunity for all to move up in life, one that leaves no one behind, one that treats all with dignity and respect, in short, one that makes everybody feel included. Now, I think we can agree quite quickly that both social mobility and inclusivity must be part of our desired future. But this still doesn't quite resolve the problem of inequalities, inequality of outcomes. And I'd like to take a moment to share my views on this. I'm going to go down a side road for a while, and I'll come back to the main road shortly. First, minimum wages. Now, I support a minimum wage in principle and also in spirit. But I struggle with whether and how a minimum wage would work for a city-state like Singapore. My concerns have to do with two special factors about Singapore, two features about Singapore. One, 
we have a very high proportion of migrant workers. Of the 1.2 million foreigners in our workforce, 834,000 are work permit holders, including 246,000 domestic workers. By comparison, our resident workforce, I mean citizens and PRs, is 2.4 million, but of this, 654,000, about one quarter, have secondary education and below. A lower number, the 654,000, than the work permit holders, 834,000. Number two, we are surrounded by countries with excess labor, especially at the lower skilled end. So the potential supply is therefore huge. Now, my assumption is that any national minimum wage must apply equally to migrant workers. Now, many proponents of minimum wages seem to have elided over this point. But both the ILO and the UN have adopted the position that in respect of remuneration, all migrant workers have the right to enjoy treatment no less favorable than the nationals of the country. Given this, no self-respecting labor exporting country would allow their migrant workers to be paid less than what their residents are entitled by law, if there is a law. Simply put, if Singapore adopts a national mon minimum monthly wage of, say, $1,200, this has to be paid to our migrant workers too, including domestic workers. So the first impact is a huge cost to the economy. Now, truth be told, a Singapore minimum wage will be higher than the going wage of low-skilled workers in their home country. Now, if the gap is large, you can imagine that the number of migrant workers wanting jobs here at our minimum wage will far exceed our capacity to absorb them. This demand and supply imbalance will lead to a host of problems. Illegal workers, middlemen who extort huge commissions, etc. And policing a minimum wage will not be a tri trivial task. For domestic workers, if they have to be paid the Singapore minimum wage, employers might start charging for board and lodge. Imagine the disputes this might arise, that this might lead to. So all told, it would be far better in my view for Singapore to pursue other approaches to help our low wage workers. Now, one safety net we already have, a Singapore invention, is not the progressive wage model, but the workfare income supplement called WIS, established in 2007. Now, this is an excellent scheme, targeted at citizens only, where the WIS tops up the monthly salary of low-wage workers by up to 30%. Now, initially, the WIS benefited 300,000 workers and now uh, the scheme was enhanced in 2020, and now almost 500,000 workers are beneficiaries. And if you look at my number, it's 654 secondary and below. And now we, the WIS uh, number of beneficiaries is 500,000. And the government pays out 850 million a year for the WIS. And this is actually set to grow even further in two years' time. The PM has already said it in one of the National Day rallies. Now, an MTI study found that the WIS 
has incentivized less educated, the less educated and the elderly to enter or re-enter the workforce and remain in the workforce. So it has had that benefit. Now, clearly, the WIS can be the centerpiece of Singapore's low-wage support policy, not minimum wages. Now, the other Singapore invention, which I talked about, the, the mentioned, the progressive wage model, uh, the tripartite effort to help lower-wage uh, workers get wage increases, the ladder of increases, through skills upgrading, can be an important additional support. So if I were to use Taman's uh, uh, analogies, everybody has to go up the escalator, but you've got to get them to the escalator. So the WIS gets you to the escalator, the progressive wage model gets you up the escalator. A separate point I would make is that it might be a good idea to tie the WIS, the 850 million, to wealth taxes so that Singaporeans can see that wealth is being redistributed in a purposeful way. This will go some way to addressing unhappiness over inequality. This brings me to wealth taxes. One part of Ravi Menon's speech last July, in fact, raised a bit of a kerfuffle in the wealth management industry here. This was when he said that to promote an inclusive society, it might make sense to shift our tax structure away from taxing income towards taxing wealth. A wealth tax, he added, could take the form of either a property gains tax or an inheritance tax which, by the way, inheritance taxes were abolished in 2008. Now, that disturbed some people. Then last month, Finance Minister Lawrence Wong in his budget statement spelled out clearly what the government's policy on wealth taxes was. What he said was, is worth quoting in some length. He said, wealth taxes are an important part of our tax system. Apart from generating revenue, they mitigate social inequalities. Wealth taxes are therefore needed to build a fairer society. Ideally, this is Lawrence Wong talking, we would want to tax the net wealth of individuals, net wealth meaning assets minus the liabilities. But such a tax is not easy to implement effectively. Estimating wealth accurately and fairly is more complex exercise than estimating incomes. Further, many forms of wealth are mobile and can and will move. He then went on to cite the experience of the OECD countries where the number of countries that levy taxes on net wealth has dropped from 12 in 1990 to only 3 in 2020, mainly because of implementation difficulties. And then he said this, and I think this is an important quote. We will continue to study the experiences of other countries and explore options to tax wealth effectively. In the meantime, we will strengthen our current system of taxes. So the search for an effective wealth tax continues. While Mr. Wong did not introduce any new wealth taxes, he announced a hike in property taxes, which is the current principal means of taxing wealth. So a large detached house in the CBD, or in the central, not CBD, in, in the central area, that's not owner-occupied, will see an increase in the property tax bill to 43,000 a year. For a similar property that is owner-occupied, the tax will go up to 28,000 a year. These increases will be done in two steps, partly because it's a big increase. Now, the question this raises is, or it raised in my mind at least, will Singapore keep to its policy of encouraging and not disincentivizing wealth creation? I hope the answer is 
yes, it will. It will keep to that policy. In 2008, DPM Taman, then finance minister, gave this explanation. And he said, quote, if we make Singapore an attractive place for wealth to be invested and built up, whether by Singaporeans or by foreigners who bring their assets here, it will benefit our whole economy and society, not just the individuals who built up that wealth. I want to move on to argue for another initiative on philanthropy. I feel strongly that philanthropy should be a key part of Singapore's desired future. And it, build, and it should build on the example set by our pioneer philanthropists. Rather than add more wealth taxes to address inequality, it might be more effective to promote and celebrate philanthropy on a wider scale. The aim should be to instill a sense of noblesse oblige among today's wealthy and encourage them to give back to our society. Now, Singapore has more than 400 foundations and trusts registered with the Commission of Charities. Of these, some 90 are large foundations who together gave out 264 million in their latest financial year. This includes the likes of the iconic Lee Foundation and Lien Foundation, as well as Tamasic Foundation, which is doing inspirational work, and the Community Foundation of Singapore. According to the COC's 2020 annual report, the total donations in Singapore made in FY29 came to 3.25 billion, up 30%. And it benefited some 2,300 registered charities. Now, in my view, a feasible desired future would be to double this by 2030 and aim for 15 to 20 billion by 2045. This would be a significant component of our future society. And at the broader level, Singapore should also strive to be a society where everyone who can helps others in need. The National Volunteer and Philanthropy Center, NVPC, whose mission is to grow a culture of giving in Singapore, raised a record high 102 million in FY21 through giving.sg, the national donation portal. NVPC's role can be elevated and bold new targets set for donations by all Singaporeans. Now, I recently attended the Singaporean of the Year Awards organized by the Straits Times. All 10 nominees had remarkable stories. But the one that made the biggest impression on me was a young couple who set up a kindness corner outside their Tampanese flat where those in need could pick up free groceries, no questions asked. Imagine that. And imagine if many more Singaporeans were to emulate this and set up kindness corners all over Singapore's heartlands. I've got a picture of them, yeah. That's outside their flat. They opened up a small kindness corner. It's like a shop. You just go there and pick up your groceries, whatever you like. So kindness, I feel, should also be made a part of our desired, desired future. And the Singapore Kindness Movement, in case you don't know they still exist, can help get us there. Now, let me get back to the main road and back to the pledge. I want to, my, my final comments on the words, so as to achieve happiness. Now, it was Rajaratnam who added the word happiness in his third draft, which the cabinet retained. Now, I remember the first time I had to recite the pledge in 1966 as a 12-year-old. The word happiness actually jumped out at me. It felt like it didn't quite belong, but I loved it. 
If there's one word we must never take out of the pledge, it's happiness. So God bless Rajaratnam. But the question we can ask and should ask is, should we do more to make happiness a key part of that desired future? Not just a word in there, but a key part. And my answer is, why not? Because what is the point of a desired future if happiness doesn't feature in it? So what is the point? Now, as far as I know, Bhutan is the only country that has made happiness part of state policy. It has a gross national happiness index, which since 2008 has been part of the country's constitution. Now, people don't take that too seriously because they think it's a bit of a joke, national happiness index. But their definition of happiness is not the common meaning of happiness. Theirs is a deeper Buddhist meaning. And their index measures ingredient, the ingredients for happiness, such as good health, well-being, and a whole lot more. The problem is that they've got a whole lot more. They should have you know, tightened it a bit. So, so what they're measuring is the ingredients of happiness, not whether people are happy in the usual joyful sense of the word. Okay? Uh, interestingly, I checked what time use meant. Actually, what they do is they measure how much sleep you get. You know, happiness index. Now, what Bhutan's experience tells us, or told me, is we do need to think about what our idea of happiness is or should be as a country. Meantime, however, there is an urgent need to alleviate ill health, distress, discontent, all manner of ills in our society and woe betide us if this gets worse. So let me summarize thus, what I've said thus far about the pledge. Number one, the Singapore Pledge forms an excellent basis for an updated desired future for Singapore. Number two, the goal of one united people should remain, but should include other differences apart from race, language, or religion. Number three, we should add social mobility and inclusivity in addition to equality. Number four, we can leaven inequality of outcomes through philanthropy and kindness. And number five, we should retain happiness as a goal, but define what we mean by happiness. Now, let me move on to new areas and issues that didn't exist in 1966, which must feature um, in any desired future. I will focus on three areas. First, action on the climate crisis and the broader challenge of sustainable development. I mentioned earlier Singapore's net zero targets and the new carbon taxes. The climate crisis is without doubt the most urgent global challenge of our times. Any desired future for Singapore must include the UN's broader Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. The 17 SDGs were adopted by the UN in 2015. Interestingly, an earlier UN policy document on this was titled The Future of the The Future We Want. I wish they had kept that name because, in effect, this is the UN's desired future for the world. So, in this area, we don't need to do any backcasting, just adopt that. Now, one success the UN has had in mobilizing the young, is in mobilizing the young generation. The SDGs have caught the attention of millennials and Generation Z, who worry that they will inherit a broken and degraded world. But what's needed are realistic pathways to the desired future. It cannot be reached by idealism alone. The next new area is technology advances. Now this is the hardest to forecast or backcast. 
What we know is the use and application of technologies, especially digital technologies, have seen high-speed advances in recent years. There have been sudden spurts after decades of trying. Uh, in, in the last five years, sudden spurts, for example, in vehicle te technologies, from hybrid cars to fully electric cars and very soon driverless cars. They struggled with batteries for a long time and then all of a sudden electric cars came. Identifying which technologies will experience similar trends over the next two decades is made difficult by the cycle of hype and disillusionment in most emerging technologies. Yet, we have to try and look over the horizon. Now, I don't propose to go and survey the whole field, but by all expert accounts, artificial intelligence, or AI, merits special focus. Now, before we try and do any backcasting, we need to understand why AI is special. So let me list them out. Number one, AI involves smart machines that can perform tasks that typically require human intelligence. So indeed, this is technology of a unique kind. Secondly, AI uses computers to harness massive amounts of data and then uses what's called learned intelligence to make super fast decisions. In my last lecture, I spoke about real-time bidding in the digital advertising space. That's AI at work at the speed of light. Number three, AI will have a transformative impact, not just on one industry, but on almost every industry. And number four, almost everyone agrees. AI's pervasive use is set to take off exponentially. Now, as if this is not enough, there are some kickers in there too. Because whereas AI-driven machines and robots have mainly so far been deployed for lower value, repetitive work, in the coming future, and this may happen sooner than we think, it will affect high value intellectual tasks. In almost all professions, medicine, accounting, law, etc., the productivity gains will be huge, but many jobs will be at risk, including high-end jobs. A further factor is the geopolitical contest in technology. This will, add, this will be an added spur that will drive technology at speeds never seen before. We need only to look at the speed at which COVID vaccines were developed. One worry, which I won't go into, is the development of AI in harmful directions. So, how best can we capture all of this in Singapore's desired future? I can only describe the future this way. In 2020, I'm putting myself in 2045. An AI-driven economy and society where we enjoy the full productivity dividends but also address likely job displacements. Now, if we then backcast to now, the best strategy is simply to embrace AI fully. Because being short of labor, for Singapore, AI's productivity gains can help us reduce the reliance on Singapore-based foreign manpower. But we will have to figure out how to deal with two challenges. One, ensure that we have enough AI skills of our own to drive an AI economy, and also find ways to tap remote skills through our global connectivity. And number two, we have to pre be prepared to manage big spikes in job displacements and have in place retraining, reskilling schemes. I will move now to the, to the internet and the metaverse. I spoke in my last lecture about how achieving a global consensus on governance of the internet will be a bridge too far. And Singapore will have to find its own way forward. 
I also outlined a desired future for the internet, not my original, but I put together this uh, desired future. A secure, trustworthy, inclusive, and open internet. Now, if we backcast from that to what steps we need now, each of those goals require immediate collaborative action. Number one, to be secure, we will have to deal with scams, fraud, cybercrime, the whole bunch, and especially how to keep it safe for children. To be trustworthy, effective ways must be found to deal with fake news, willful misinformation, outright propaganda, the whole shebang. To be inclusive will require steps to deal with the digital divide. To remain open will depend on success in keeping it safe and keeping out the crooks and the criminals. <clears throat> now, let me speak next about the metaverse. Now, if you think this is pie-in-the-sky stuff, you may have to think again. There is good reason why Facebook took the bold step of rebranding their parent company, Meta. It will be part of the future. I recently read a report. Sorry. A report of the top 100 trends produced yearly by a consultancy called Wonderman Thompson. Of the top 100 trends for 2022, seven were related to the metaverse. Let me quote you from the metaverse, uh, from the Wunderman uh, Thompson report. Quote, a new digital era is on the horizon as the metaverse evolves from a sci-fi concept into a reality. Virtual worlds where people can gather, create, buy and sell, socialize, live and work are becoming the new hangouts. It then goes on to talk about advanced avatars, virtual, these are current top trends huh, in, for 2022. Advanced avatars, virtual teleportation, NFT marketplace, marketplaces, and a new direct-to-avatar retail model. Now, that may still sound like sci-fi, but parts of the metaverse are already here. I mentioned in my previous lecture sites like Roblox, which already have a huge teenage audience. Actually, coincidentally, after I mentioned it, a teenage girl in the US was kidnapped and sexually abused by an older man whom she met at Ro in Roblox. So clearly there are dangers. For Singapore's desired future, our best option on the metaverse is simply to be a part of it and don't run away from it and benefit from its opportunities. And to get there, we need to start being closely engaged with the metaverse from now. We should do it if only because our young will be deeply in it. We will also need to take steps to keep it safe and keep out the criminals. So let me summarize the action needed on the new areas I've covered. Number one, act on the climate crisis. Number two, adopt the UN's 17 SDGs. Number three, embrace AI, seize the productivity gains, but pre prepare for the job displacements. Number four, work towards a secure, trustworthy, inclusive, and open internet. And number five, be closely engaged with the metaverse. This is by no means an exhaustive list. Together with my earlier list of updates to the Singapore Pledge, they will keep Singapore, in my view, going to 2045, one milestone at a time. Now, there are some areas I have not been able to cover. Uh, for example, the fundamentals, like good governance with no corruption, meritocracy, resilience, remaining open and global, and ensuring a competitive economy that produces good jobs as well as good returns. And also, I haven't talked about shared core, core values, such as hard work, 
integrity, tolerance, and of course kindness too, which I talked about. But taking all of this in, the overall desired future for Singapore that I would describe is, in 2045, put myself there, what is it that I would, what is it, what is feasible uh, that we would want? I would describe it this way. A well-governed, peaceful, safe, thriving, and sustainable city-state where people are united, socially mobile, inclusive, kind, and happy. And of course, happiness needs to be defined. So this concludes part two of my talk and uh, on the desired futures for Singapore. I will now talk about the desired futures for the Singapore media. Now, the local legacy media will of course have a big role to play in the Singapore's desired futures um, and in also in getting there but they must first keep themselves going, have their own desired future, and plot their own path. So I'll cover this now in my concluding part. I will again, of course, focus my comments on the future of the legacy media, in particular, SPH Media Trust. I'm also speaking in my personal capacity, so these are all my own views. I've not consulted any one of them. I explained in my first lecture the background and rationale for creating the SMT. Parliament has just approved the funding support for SMT of 180 million for FY22 starting April 1. The government has said it will provide this annual funding for an initial five year period, but annual targets have to be met. Let me deal first with the with the future of journalism in Singapore and then look into the future for SMT. So I'm going to transport myself again to 2045 and describe what a feasible desired future for local journalism would look like. So in 2045, number one, there are good audiences in English and Mandarin for high quality, trusted news content, both in written and audiovisual forms. For Malay and Tamil, there are smaller but loyal audiences. Number two, niche content on other topics, everything from politics to food, also will have decent audiences. Number three, Content is delivered largely on digital formats, digital and other future digital formats. The print format is delivered as e-papers on tablets. So those who like the idea or the feeling of reading papers can read it on, on tablets. Number four, there are more players in local journalism than before, but mostly in niche sp spaces. Number five, there are a myriad other sources of news all over the web, which by then will be web four or web five. With that as the backdrop, let me try and describe a feasible desired future for SMT. Remember, I'm still in 2045. Number one, SMT distinguishes its offerings from others through the quality of its content. But the key differentiator is the trust it has gained from users over, years, over the years through accuracy and balanced coverage. Number two, strong SMT newsrooms, well supported by technology and AI, produce compelling content. Number three, SMT's regional and international paid reach has grown after years of strong subscription campaigns. Number four, Chao Pao has wide reach in both in Singapore, no, in Singapore, China, and among the Chinese diaspora outside China. Number five, SMT's Malay and Tamil papers 
having invested in stronger newsrooms, are alive and well, but supported partly by benefactors. Now, if you ask me to summarize all of that and describe it in one sentence, here's what I would say for SMT, the SMT of 2045. A financially independent, thriving media group whose products in four languages are trusted by both their Singapore audience and regional and international audiences, all of whom pay for their premium content. Now, you will have noticed I said SMT is financially independent in the future. I, I will come back to that. Now, backcasting now, coming back to today, what will it take for SMT to get to that desired future? So let me list them, the priorities. Number one, forward-looking people policies with a sharp focus on talent acquisition and retention and on high employee engagement. Number two, continuous investment in the technology stack to support journalists and news operations, as well as all other media functions. Greater use of data and AI, which is already being used in newsrooms elsewhere, must drive innovations. This is where SMT can make the biggest leap and where the government funding must be put to good effect. Number three, capability in subscription sales has to be scaled up quickly for both corporate sales and international sales. Subscription revenues must make a significant contribution to SMT's revenues. More attention must also be paid to just plain satisfying customers. Number four, a big challenge is to turn around the long decline in advertising revenues through new strategies that capitalize on SMT's total reach of about 73%, supported 73% across all its platforms, supported by the use of technology. Number five, SMT must seek broad community support for its mission of providing trusted news in four languages as a public good. And lastly, targeted investments in media-related businesses to generate new streams of future revenue. Given resources, I am confident SMT strategies will succeed. That is why I believe it is feasible for SMT to achieve its medium-term goal of being financially independent. Let me conclude by giving you results from two recent surveys, which kind of explains why I'm confident. Because they show, number one, strong interest in news and readership in Singapore, and number two, high levels of trust. I believe SMT can build on this and grow. So let me show you the first one. Oh, by the way, I just thought this was funny. I just saw that. So um, the first survey is done by NTU uh, from the Center for Information Integrity and the Internet at the Wikimbury School. Reasons for internet use. And this is quite you know, encouraging for me. 81% said it was to stay informed of latest news. 81%. Next one. How often do you consume news via the following? And the percentage who said often or very often. Read local newspaper websites. 43%. Read print copy of local newspaper. 28%. Now, there will, of course, be a bit of duplication here, so I won't, you can't just add up the two percentages. But let's say half of the, the people who read print also read uh, uh, di uh, newspaper websites. We are well past 50%. Let me go to the second uh, report, which is 
the one that was mentioned uh, in the last, uh, during the Q&A. The Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism, 2021 Digital News Report. Results for Singapore. Most popular news brand. Offline, offline meaning on TV and in print. CNA, 39%. Straits Times, 38%. This is offline. Online. Weekly use, CNA 48%, ST Online 40%. Now there are two numbers, one is weekly, the other is at least three days a week. And both numbers uh, are well ahead of all the others. Uh, I should mention that Mothership SG's numbers are looking very good. And this is something that perhaps we can talk about later. Uh, and the last number I would say is trust uh, in the media. Most trusted news sources, CNA is 79, Straits Times is 77. So we're both up there. And these are our legacy media. So this is why I'm happy. I'm a confident, I'm confident, and uh, uh, so I just want to thank you, thank everybody for listening. Uh, I've enjoyed doing the three lectures. I hope you found it useful. Thank you. I kept to my time. Thank you, Mr. Daniel. For those watching the lecture on Facebook, please submit your comments and questions through the Facebook comment box. For our audience members here, please step up to the mic to ask your questions. May I now invite Dr. Shashi Jayakumar to start a Q&A session. Thanks to the, the audience members who have come and agreed to, to listen to what Patrick had to say today. There's plenty of food for thought uh, across what he's given us, very rich and textured today. And in, in what follows, I'll also try to range a little bit uh, across what you've been saying so thought-provokingly across the first, first two, two lectures. Patrick, I'm very impressed by your, your backcasting methodology, you know, but I, I'm a bit of an old fogey my, myself, so mm -hmm. I don't have uh, really access to this kind of advanced uh, futuristic thinking. So if you could allow me to do the old-fashioned kind of future casting, you try to sketch out 2045. What are the best outcomes in so many spheres of our society? Society mainstream, the youth, and SMT, and its related mm. stable of, of offerings. But if I could sort of play the devil's advocate and look to 2045 future, where some of the things that you're positing, and positing fairly convincingly, let's say, work out, but not quite as well as you are, you are suggesting. So if I may, mm, and, sure, and please, sure. please indulge me. Yeah. When, when I, in my own research work, engage with the young people, sometimes at schools and so on, and I always ask them what are the platforms or news sources, aggregators they, they, they engage with. As TCN is there, they're clearly aware, but quite often uppermost might be something like TikTok. TikTok, especially over the last, yeah. last few years, mm. you, you know better than mm. me, mm. To, to some degree, WhatsApp, Instagram, and believe mm. it or not, as counterintuitive as it may seem, at least at the think tank level, we may have to accept that in as much as they get news, they're actually getting it from those which are not primarily from our vantage point news, news sources. They're mm. communications mm. Uh, platforms. And these things change, they ebb and they flow. If, you, if, they, if I'd asked them three years ago, they may have said Snapchat, but mm. to, to some who are real experts, they may say that's also sort of like a, a phase. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm trying to parlay all of this into a, into a question, so, so bear with me. In this desired future, 2045, when ST, uh, beg your pardon, SMT and its, and its offerings wants to have a stable base where the youth of today, the future backbone of tomorrow Singapore uh, middle class society, uh, trust it, regularly resort to it, find it credible and, and trustworthy. Sorry, I'm looking for, I'm going to give yeah. you some data. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, go yeah. ahead, yeah. please, I'm listening. And here are a couple of questions just to, we mm. appreciate your thoughts on mm. this. 
when SMT gets to that future where it's regularly read and listened to, to what degree, firstly, should it sort of be imitative of some of the other technologies I've talking talking mm. about, mm. using the methodology of TikTok videos, uh, things which some of us in the mainstream might find even a little bit gimmicky, used by by new media platforms, and to what degree, if it chooses to go into that kind of future, would this possibly lead to a, a, a shallowing of discourse? Mm. Third, and you don't have to take all of these, just mm. th those which you find more more, so more interesting. The, the, the shallowing discourse, yeah. what was your the point if, of if it the goes question? Into, if it what, goes what into we, a kind what, of... What a, do we do about it? Yeah, technologically okay, infused future. Okay. Okay. And I suppose the final one is, we do want SMT, its offerings in that future to, to be trusted, respected, credible. But is there a risk that it may seem to be, or all those things, but rather niche, rather highbrow, sort of a resource for the educator, the, the, the real intelligentsia mm. of, on the administrators of, of Singapore? I appreciate that these are a mishmash of sure. questions, but feel okay. free to... to sure. Elaborate. Sure. The, the first thing I will say is these are things that we track quite closely. Okay. So, for example, I know that the, the, the common view is that we're losing the young readers. They were going to TikTok, etc. But actually, our data the data that I, I just saw before I, I, I stepped off, was that surprisingly, even from 15 to 24, our readership is actually quite high. From 25 to 34, also quite high. Higher than all the others. Now, of course, it all depends on which uh, uh, surveys you take. But we have our own, uh, uh, in, well, they're not in-house, we engage them to track our readership, etc. I mentioned the 73% reach, that's an in-house uh, survey of all our platforms, how, what percentage we reach, people on radio, on, on magazines, outdoor, etc. But by age group, the latest data that was just sent to me was, and I can, I can cite this, that the readership of the Straits Times, I'm just looking at the Straits Times, they sent me that one, of, is actually mirrors the profile of Singapore. So, Gen Z, age 15 to 24, comprise 13% of Singaporeans age 15 and above. 13%. And the ST readership in that group, 12%. 12%. Now, you would have thought maybe you'd be lucky to get 2%, but no, 12%. Now, you then take, uh, let's say, millennials, 29%, the, the national profile. ST, exactly 29%. <laughs> Gen X, slightly older, 40 to 54 now. Profile is 25%, we have 30%. Interestingly, the older fellas are falling off, you know, because this is all digital, you know. So when you get to the older group, you find the numbers, the percentages drop. So there are two points I want to make. Number one is this is so critical to us that if by 2045 we've already lost all the young fellows, uh, there won't be anybody reading us. That's the point that you know you make. So we know that, and we are therefore tracking it. First point. Second point is that the numbers actually look quite, you know, uh, uh, positive. Not just this, but several. MCI does its own. Everybody is tracking age group readership. How long they read, where where they read. Now the difference is, the young fellas, they are reading all over the place. You know. You and I, maybe we just read, you know, all the legacy, you know, newspapers, New York Times, da, da, da. We got no time for TikTok, you know. I don't know about y'all. I got no time for TikTok. I mean, just so many things to do. So, but the young fellas do. So, then comes my third point. 
What we've done is, we've actually followed them all platforms. So we are mm. on all the platforms. You name it, we are there. TikTok, you know, Pinterest, you know, Instagram. Now, we're small. We're not mass readership there, but we're there. We're experimenting, seeing what, what people like, etc. And so, so that's what we're doing now. We haven't invested huge amounts of money on all these platforms, but we are there. Very early, we went into YouTube. And these are all free. It's not paid, paid content. So we took free content and put on all these things. So I'm, I'm encouraged by the numbers. And I'm also encouraged that my former colleagues, and, and, and a lot of this is done by the newsrooms. Right? We don't go and tell them what to do, go to TikTok. They just do it. They just say, ooh, this sounds interesting. Let's try. So it's happening. Mm. So I'm not so, again, this is backcasting or forecasting, whichever you want to say. Want to say. I think that there's a feasible uh, uh, future of being well read in 2040, 2045. So that's the first part of your question. Second part of your question is the shallowing of, you know, intellectual discourse, you know. Uh, that is the reason why we have not let up. You see, you know, if you're, if you're in the news business now, there are two ways you can do it. You can say, forget about all these new old-fashioned ways. Let's just go after what the kids are doing because they are the future. Yeah. So if they're going to TikTok, let's all go to TikTok. If they're going to YouTube, let's go to YouTube and forget the, the core business. We have not done that. So that, that part of the business, the news business the, from the legacy uh, media, will remain the core. All of this is, we're getting in there to experiment, to see what works for us, and so that we know what to do next. So I, I, I wouldn't worry so much about the shallowing of uh, 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 readership. Uh, surprisingly, you, you, you will actually be very surprised that the amount of things that Singaporeans read in the newspapers staggers visitors who come here. And they have staggered it for the last I don't know how many years. I've had so many people who come here I had one uh, French, French journalist who came here. He thought he got a MCI grant to come to Singapore. So he thought, oh, I can take a holiday. He came here and he was in the middle of a, of a presidential election. And he said, my goodness me, the amount of space you give to, this, to my presidential election and the amount of questions, I go everywhere. People are asking me, hey, who's going to win? Da, da, da. He said, you fellas really follow it. I said, yeah, that's because we devote space, you know, in our paper. So actually, Singaporeans are quite well informed. Now, having said that, I would say one problem I have is the amount of crap that goes down the WhatsApps of this, you know, just too much that you don't know what to believe anymore, you know, and a lot of it, unfortunately, is not true. So I, you know, I, I watch and I wonder how we, we will deal with this, you know. I mean, say you take Ukraine. I mean, suddenly the WhatsApp is like sizzling, sizzling. Every day I get all kinds of stuff. I read them all, you know. But some of them very suspect. And the, the problem also is that the... The, 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 the propagandists, the spin masters, are really at it, I tell you. I have never seen them, you know, it's coming from all over the place. Somebody is there pumping up, you know, this information. So there we are trying to be accurate, trying to be, you know, trustworthy. And this stuff is coming up. So you are right, I'm scratching my head too, you know, I'm saying, Will it be enough just to say, ooh, quality content and trustworthiness? In the meantime, 
the whole social media is buzzing with all kinds of stuff. But we won't touch it unless we are we're sure that it's accurate. So, yeah, and it's a long answer, but uh, it, it's a lot of things are, that are happening. So, long answer, good answer. Mm. Thanks for indulging this question from an old, old mm. fogey. I am... Uh, You're a young man, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, on, on that, I, mm. I am... Uh, I suppose a national security researcher, you are a seasoned media professional, practitioner. I'm not sure about you, but for my line of work, this is grounds or cause for almost eternal pessimism. Mm. Looking at some of these things, you've just alluded to some of these contemporary issues, which are security, but which in some ways cut to the heart of uh, national discourse and resilience uh, as well. Mm. I, I'm, in my question, not going to go to any particular flashpoint of conflict because there, there are so many. Mm. right now, but in a generalised sense and mm. generalizably, if you're able to go into some, some thoughts, what's at various other platforms where issues pertaining to, to how we feel about various, let's say, global flash, flash, flashpoints are, are discussed? I am personally and from the point of view of my centre increasingly concerned that while top level decision makers might, might make calls and these, these calls that policy makers make may be on very good grounds. National security principles, international law, quite often the, the, the discourse, and this is heavily anecdotal of course, mm. the discourse may well be at the coffee shop level, oh, why do you do this? Why do we behave this way? Do we really need to do this? Do we need to get our necks stuck into to all these kinds of issues? Principles are great, but how about Singapore, we're just a small country? I'm sure you're, you're familiar yeah, yeah. with it. I mean, and it's I'm, happening now, but after we however, put sam yeah, sanctions. Yeah. Absolutely, but I'm not talking about any one particular flashpoint, because this, this could apply to so many, so many, yeah. so, so many things. Mm. Now, hold that thought, if you will, and let's track back to 2045, SMT, Stable of Offerings. It certainly has a role in, and I'm not going to fill in the words for you, but let's say conveying the news in an impartial, factual, but yet still analytical fashion. Mm. If, let's say, it expands on this, should it expand on this to play some role in terms of national discourse, and this is hard to say, I can't really find the right words, but let's say putting all of us, Singaporeans, not on one single page, because there are always dissonances and divergences on opinion, mm. but does it play some sort of role beyond the factual analytical in terms of mm. putting us roughly on some plain national discourse where we mm. may agree to disagree, but we talk intelligibly and rationally, and we're not splintered aside by these mm. polarizations of thought. Okay. I mean, it's a tough question, tough challenge you're posing, but I, I would say this. The first is the basics, which mm. is that, you know, don't put out inaccurate spin, propaganda, all kinds of mm. stick to what is factual. And make that's no, you know, there's both sides are, are, are spinning, you know. So everybody is spinning. any issue you get one spin from this side, you get another spin from that side. You got to take a factual approach, know who are the reasonable people, and make sure that it's, it's straight down the middle. That's the first point. And you got to make sure that if not 100 percent, but at least you know, 99% uh, uh, of it must be, you know, kosher. Mm. First point. The second point is that where messages or, or stories are actually debunked, mm. we, we have to say that. Because these stories never die. They just keep spinning, you know, they come up. So, so where it is debunked, we, it's not that we will go out of our way to debunk people, but where we know that this is, this is not true, we should contribute to that conversation that way. But even then, it is still very difficult, you know. I mean, you take, you take uh, uh, recent events. The, the spin is coming from official spokesmen. You go to a press conference, the official spokesman says this, and you sort of scratch your head and say, 
Where did he get this information? Right? And what do you do? Do you report it? Or don't you report it? Even if you know that this fellow is actually lying through his teeth. Mm. You know? So it becomes, this is uncharted, you know. Usually when a spokesman speaks, he's, he's, he speaks the truth, you know. Now you can't, you, you don't know, you know. And I'm talking about both sides. I'm not even, you know, whether it's US, China, Russia, you know, everybody. So it becomes very difficult for us to kind of hold the ground and lift ourselves a little bit higher without sort of getting into the, into the, the mud, mm. you know. Um, so it, I, it, it all depends how things go and whether this is a, you know, a mad phase where people who should know better uh, are doing things like just spinning out, spewing out falsehoods. Mm. I've not seen it, you know, I mean, I've been 30 years in the business. I've not seen this, you know, this kind of uh, spin I don't know about in security, but it's just, you know, unprecedented amounts of uh, uh, factual latitude, you know. Mm. They just decide, they just invent their stories and their facts. Now, it could be that things will kind of come back to, I mean, this is just a crazy phase, I don't know, maybe the, you know, the stars are misaligned or something and everybody's going a bit bonkers, you know. But I don't know. So we are watching that too, holding the line, uh, trying not to, but it's gotten to a point now where, you know, there's, there's confirmation bias in, in all manner of biases. Mm. You know, I, I said this, I spoke about this in my last uh, uh, lecture as well. People read a story, if they don't like your, your, the way you've presented the story, they just hate it. Mm because it doesn't accord with their own worldview. So it's very hard for us to kind of balance it and, you know, uh, do we just go straight down the middle and then the people who disagree with you just fall out, stop reading? Or do you kind of say, okay, there's this point of view, there's this point of view, this is unconfirmed, this is confirmed, and then you make up your own mind. Mm. Uh, it's going to be a challenge. So I, I don't have a, a pat answer for you. Yeah, I would be surprised or concerned if there were <laughs> yeah, a pat, yeah. pat, pat answer. Just to press you a little bit, in your, your first lecture, you talked about the history of Straits Times, other newspapers under the SPH stable, and you were very clear that the policymakers and media leaders, leaders here historically had a view of the, the media, which is different from what was seen as the West. It's not a fourth a state. It's not necessarily crusading journalism. It doesn't exist solely or primarily to call out or to, to check mm. the, uh, the powers that be. But on this issue, which I, I'm concerned with in my own professional life, national resilience, cohesion, what role in future can or should ST, SMT offerings play, play in this? And I know it's sort of in a way related to what you've just answered, but the overall tone and tenor of the, the offerings role in the national narrative? Because from the policymaker point of view, it, it would be ideal if you had a stable of offerings which sort of supported uh, this, this issue of cohesion. And I strongly suspect mm. cohesion is, is increasingly going to be mm. under stress in the decades mm. to come. But that's perhaps how the policymakers might feel. But from the editorial, the reporter point of view, because SMT's offerings, they might want other things as well to bring in the eyeballs to compete with technologically infused mm. offerings. Mm. Would you have any, any thoughts on yeah. that, that? So, so uh, your last point is, 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 uh, is the key, you know. Uh, the one thing we mustn't do is chase after eyeballs. Yep. That leads, look at where it's led the social media, mm. you know. Uh, I won't mention names, but the giant tech companies, look at where they lead, led them. Why? Because mm. they're all chasing eyeballs. You know, the, you know, if you say angry, they send you more stuff to make you even angrier. I mean, that, that kind of, of uh, 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 policy, that kind of approach is just going to lead you down, you know, into the back alleys mm. and the rubbish bins. Mm. So, that we won't do. 
won't chase eyeballs. Okay, then what do we chase? So, unfortunately, if you think you're old fogey, we are also old fogeys. We want to do the traditional, you know, journalism. Uh, we're not going to go chase after people and 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 you know spill as much dirt as we can. That's not the role that we want to play. Because half the time, your betting average is actually very low. You, know? mm. you try to be a watchdog. Half the time, you, you are wrong. Then what do you do? Mm. Then what they do, you know, you, 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 you tweak it to make it sound. Actually, a good editor looks at it and say, listen, mate, you ain't got, there's no beef in here. You know? So, it's, it's tough, you know? Mm. So, um, but I can't help you as a, as a, in your, your national securities resilience thing very much, but we can be the purveyor of, you know, accurate news. Mm. You know, if I can mm -hmm. do that, mm. and people read, that's the important part. I can be purveyor of, of accurate news, but people don't read, then that's no use, you know. So it's got to be compelling, it's got to be right on the button and accurate. At least, and people trust it so that they know, oh, Straits Times didn't say this. Straits Times said that. Therefore, that's the truth. You know? Now, I, I would already, and, but we must make sure that when we say this is the truth, it must be the truth. You know, we've checked it, and it is the truth. So, sure. I'd like to take some of the audience questions now, and one of the more interesting ones concerns how AI will impact journalism. And the question is actually quite a blunt one. Will journalism become obsolete? It's the audience question, not mine. Mm, obsolete. And what should journalists do to remain relevant? And you know, Patrick, we've had past discussions mm. on how there's actually been pretty possible journalism written not by humans, but by by, by algorithms. Mm. You had time to go into some of this in mm. your in mm. your slides and, mm. and and lecture, but would you care to expand? Yeah, sure. The word you use is a very important one. Possible. Mm. You know, it's mm. possible. Mm. You can take a news story. You give me uh, results of DBS or something. Yeah, we can put it through the AI, and the AI can produce you a story. Mm. Possible. It will get all the facts right, all the you know numbers right, but. You know, it, we have to go beyond possible. Mm. You know, mm. even if there's AI, if a company as big as as DBS, we won't put it through AI. We might put, you know, some smaller companies through AI really? because I got no time to read, you know, every other. But there are investors out there who want the story. So rather than I do ten stories, if AI can help me to do thirty stories, all of which have investors, why not? You know, mm. so half of them can be written by AI, but the big ones, if it's DBS, I want Ben Srinivasan to write it. Yep. You know, mm. I don't want my AI to write. So mm. that's my, my, my answer to, to, to the questioner. There are many things that we don't write because we got no bodies to write. If there's AI journalists, yeah, I will give them plenty of things to write. And it will be quite rich. You know that every day you open the paper, you happen to have a, especially on the business side, you know, I was in BT for a long time. And, um, you know, if you happen to be, a, you know, you own shares in, I don't know, uh, a, a small and medium, small size company that is doing very well, they can't even get one inch in the newspaper. You know, because we just got no space. and got no people to go chase them. But now that online, if the AI can produce, I will produce them. Boom, boom, boom. And then you just do your recommend, you know, you do your search, you give me all the lists of companies that you have investments, I'll give you the story, the AI written stories every day. I'll give you the break, I'll give you breaking news. Hmm. AI breaking news. You know, <laughs> tell you what's happened. So there it's already in the space and um, uh, uh, it's being used for recommendation engines for you know, if you if you want to track personalized news, AI will do it for you. Okay. So we will do it, but I don't think. I don't know. Maybe I'm dreaming, but I don't think we are going to be unemployed for a while. 
You know, okay. we still need good journalists with judgment. So the AI cannot give you the editor's judgment as yet. So let's see. Thank you, Patrick. I, I think I, I take so I take heart from that because mm. presumably if you're saying that about the journalism space mm. for the writing of national security reports, that mm. day is even Yeah, even Please further. don't have AI do all this. You know, your yeah. national security. You know, I want I want to live in a safe country, you know. So yeah. I take heart from this. Yeah. I uh, sort of looking at the, the audience questions and also looking at so much that we, we mm. still need to, to mm. cover. I wish yeah, we, 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 we had time. time. Yeah. Maybe one or, or two yeah. final mm. questions. Y you've highlighted in this lecture and touched on in the past role of the young, heartwarming examples of how the young come together in creative, innovative and, and ingenious ways to, to help. And really, in my own research, this is what I, I find. People accuse them of being slow, snowflake or strawberry. We, we know mm. what this means, mm. doesn't it? Not really borne out from what I see, I'll be interested to, to hear what, what you have to say, either in your journalistic work or your, just your general uh, experiences with them, because this is the future backbone society, the core mm. of your, mm. your future readership. What, what heart or, or lack mm. thereof do you, do you take from mm. your, your sense of them? Okay. I mean, if I, if I start with my own kids, you know, and um, I still remember a story when my my daughter, who's now 30, did her A-levels and uh, she went, for, went to do her GP. So she came home. I forget the, t the topic. So I said, so how's your GP? And she said, hmm. So I said, what, what was your essay topic? And she chose an essay topic. Everybody would write things like, you know, language policy or something, you know. Mm. And she chose one wacky subject. So I said, I said to her, you, you wrote this essay? She said, yeah. And I said, and what did you say? And she proceeded to tell me what she said. Mm. It was something to do, ah, I remember the story. If you are a, a celebrity, are you entitled to privacy? So I thought, you wrote an essay on that? I said, yeah. And so I said, what did you say? And she proceeded to tell me. Mm. And I said, hmm, where did you read all of this? She didn't, she doesn't read newspapers, you know, two of my wife and I would read. She would just somehow, but lo and behold, they get their news and they're from God knows where. And she was really on top of it, completely on top of the subject. So I was impressed and I said, hmm, one day I'm going to sit down and find out where, what you're reading from where. Mm. Now I find all the young people actually are quite well informed. Mm. Where they get the news, I still haven't figured out. But they get the news. They are very well informed. And, and this is good for us, you know. Now, that's my first point. Second point is, actually they go through life cycles of their own, you know. Mm. What they did when they were 18 is different from what they will do when they're 30, is different from what they do when they get married and they have kids and all that. So, I feel that maybe we shouldn't look at it in a linear way. We should actually see how people live their lives, etc. So um, that, that's why I'm hopeful, you know. If we just keep to our core values and don't go chasing around eyeballs, people will come to us and realize, okay, this is one I must read, you know. And in COVID, it was clear. They want to know about COVID, they come to us. We will tell you, no bullshit. You know, no fake news. Tell you exactly what the policy is. Boom, 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 boom. We try to explain it. And really, the numbers show that when they want accurate news, they come to us. So good thing I can, I only, my only contribution to your space is I'll be there when they want to get the accurate news. They will come to us. <laughs> so that's as much as I can, I can contribute in that space. Like resilience. It's an important part. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Patrick. Mm. I, I really, really sincerely wish we had time for, for more. Maybe a fourth lecture? No. Uh, no, 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 I guess, no, no. Okay. I've, I've done three. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess that's, that's not on the table, but <laughs> you, you've really enlivened us. And in, mm. indeed, over not just this lecture, your first two, which we all followed, given us a, a lot of texture, hopeful, up, uplifting for, mm. for the future, not just for the media industry landscape, but for the future of society and our, and our young. Mm. too. 
a lot of thank food you. for thought. Could I ask you all to please put your, your hands together to thank, thank Patrick Denham. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sashi and Mr. Daniel. May I now invite the IPS Director, Jananda Devon, to give his closing remarks. We've come to the close of Patrick's lecture series, Stewardship of the Singapore Media Staying the Course. I would like to thank Patrick for delivering three excellent lectures. He examined the history of our media, the role of the media in the digital age, and how our media scene is likely to evolve in the future. In the last lecture, in the distant future, then you look forward to about a quarter century. It is never easy to talk about controversial subjects, and there is hardly any more controversial subject issue in Singapore than our media. I didn't ask Patrick uh, to deliver the series because I thought he would be able to nudge a consensus on such an issue uh, with his charm and wit alone. We asked him, I asked him because I knew he would be honest, he would tell it as he thinks it is, and he would not shy away from expressing his views however inconvenient that might seem. And he has done precisely all that with charm and wit to boot. Truth be told, that's what we are looking for in an SR Nathan fellow. All they can do is, pointing at the evidence, say, this is so, isn't it? Seeing agreement, preferably, yes, or at least a yes but, and of course, on occasion, a firm no, it ain't. But in each instance, whatever the point of view, yes, yes but, or no, it certainly isn't, we should have before us in these lectures the clearest possible presentation of a well-considered, well-weighed, well-researched, and well-thought-through point of view that Pat has done. I would like to thank everyone who has been involved in making this semester's SR Nathan Lectures a success, including each of Pat's moderators, Professor Chan Heng Chi, Carol Soon, and of course, finally, tonight, Sashi Jayakuma. And of course, Patrick himself for so clearly and so robustly telling it as he thinks it is. It is customary to announce at the conclusion of one SR Nathan series of lectures, the next SR Nathan fellow. I'm honored to announce that it will be Professor Wang Gangu. So till the next occasion, thank you all very much for joining us and good evening. Thank you, Director. We have now come to the end of today's lecture. We would like to hear your views on the event. Please click our link on the Facebook feed to submit your feedback. Thank you all for attending today's lecture. Have a good evening ahead.